the 21st century, those who change the world are those who change the culture. They get people in sync, lead tribes, create movements, and generate an energy field where ordinary people achieve extraordinary results. There's so much talk and time spent on whether to, you know change should be top down or bottom up but the truth is is transformational change really happens side to side and as soon as as soon as you feel like you have to convince people you're going down the wrong path either you've you've got the wrong problem or the wrong people and the the way to really bring about transformational change is to identify people who are already enthusiastic about the vision and then you empower them to bring others in who are maybe slightly less enthusiastic and those and that's how you gain momentum and bring in more people still so and, and that's really what a cascade is is uh, so you want to identify those early apostles and and empower them to carry your movement. I'm Aga Bayer, and this is the Culture Lab podcast, where you will find ideas and inspiration on how to harness the power of team and organizational culture. I talk to leadership thinkers, culture experts, entrepreneurs and all sorts of movers and shakers. And together we explore the fascinating topic of culture, leadership, and personal growth. If you like what you hear, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Or better yet, write a review on iTunes and share the podcast with your followers and friends on social media. For more, check out our archive at www.agabayer.com slash podcast. Hi, and welcome to episode 38. This episode is kind of special for me because the current guest, Greg Sattel, and the guest that I will introduce at the end of this interview have both been a huge inspiration for me. And it's not just in terms of how they've shaped the way I think about culture, but also in terms of what I believe is possible for me and for us generally in our work. I have to admit that very often I have to pinch myself just to make sure that it's all real. And indeed, I do get a chance to speak to all these brilliant, brilliant people who come on the Culture Lab as guests. And since I'm giving a shout out to our guests, I also want to say that I'm super grateful for our growing audience and for the listeners who reach out, share their thoughts, encourage us to keep going. But also for those of you... Um, who haven't um, contacted us yet and uh, who haven't been in touch. I know that you regularly tune in and listen and knowing that time is our most valuable, non-renewable resource. I want to thank you for being here and I hope that we manage to do a job good enough for you to keep coming back. Okay, so now let me introduce my guest today. Greg Sattel is a popular author speaker and trusted advisor whose new book, Cascades, How to Create a Movement that Drives Transformational Change, was published by Magro Hill just a few days ago in April 2019. I've read the book. It's incredible. You should get it. And his previous book, Mapping Innovation, was selected as one of the best business books of 2017. Greg is also a contributor to Harvard Business Review and Inc., as well as Barron's and Fast Company. And he's really an amazing thinker and a great speaker. And you'll find out soon uh, listening to this interview. If you've listened to The Culture Lab a few times, you'll probably know that I really don't believe that you can mandate culture change. The only thing that you can do is to try and create a movement within your team or your company. And Greg devoted a significant amount of time and energy to research what makes successful movements effective. And he breaks it down for us in this episode, talking about how the principles of successful social movements can be applied to your team and your company. Have a listen. So Greg, welcome to Culture Lab. Thanks for having me, Alga. 
I'm really excited and very, very happy that you accepted our invitation and really can't wait to dive straight into the interview. But before we go there, I just want to ask you to tell our listeners who you are, what you do. Just introduce yourself briefly. I'm Greg Sattel. I am a author. I am a speaker and I am advisor to companies and organizations. Fantastic. So there's one question that we always um, ask in the beginning of each of the interviews that we've done so far. And the question is, what were the early cultural influences that shaped you, that shaped you as a person? In other words, what made Greg, Greg? That's a that's an excellent question. Uh, I, I think probably, you know, there's lots of things, of course, family, friends, birthplace. But I think one of the, the most important influences was uh, with athletics. Uh, I was a football player in high school and then a wrestler in high school and college. But that, that, uh, that experience of wrestling at the top levels in college, uh, the, the, uh, to pursue that kind of excellence, I think has really shaped me more than anything else I've 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 done to to really uh, work towards perfection and and to compete against uh, you know against really top athletes and really have to be on top of your game I think is 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 really spills over into everything you do uh, you wouldn't think wrestling has anything to do with writing but that. Uh, constant hmm. focus on technique and improving every day, I, I think has been really, really important. I can imagine. So yeah, that would be actually my next question, uh, but maybe you've already answered that. So if there was one thing that you would point to in terms of what uh, was the biggest learning from, from that experience, what is it? Is it the discipline of pursuing your craft and technique or something else? Yeah, I think, you, you know, when you're in high school and and you're competing, generally the good athletes beat the bad athletes, right? Uh, you know, if you're stronger and faster, you'll you'll beat the other kids, right? But then you get into you know college and top level in in, in at university, and everybody's strong and everybody's fast. And what you learn, and the first thing we learned in in when in, in sort in our freshman camp at college is our coach said, "Okay, we're going to go. We're going to learn the basics." And we said, "Oh, this is stuff that we hadn't worked on since we were seven or eight. We know all that stuff, <laughs> but right. that's what you learn that you're only as good as your fundamentals, and you need to work on them." every single day. So we had to relearn our fundamentals. And that's what we worked on every single day after that, getting better, honing your technique, not so much learning new things, uh, although we, we did that as well. But really, the focus was always on the fundamentals and how good your fundamentals and getting them better every single day. And that's what I think really carries over that, that excellence in basic things rather than trying to learn something fancy. And I have to say that after reading your book, and thank you for sending it to me, I really enjoyed reading it, Cascades, uh, I, I realized that um, this focus on the fundamentals um, stayed with you because the book actually uh, tries to identify what the fundamentals of a uh, successful change are and then um, helping people uh, find a way to really master them. Right. Yeah, absolutely. One of my main sources for the book was a guy named Serja Popovich, who was a a leader in the Serbian revolution that overthrew Milosevic. And since then, he has trained activists in almost 50 countries, you know, uh, Egypt, Ukraine, Zimbabwe, Burma, on and on and on. And he What's amazing is that every single country he goes to, obviously the details are different, but the same fundamental 
principles apply. And what I found so incredibly interesting in the book is that when I went to talk to uh, people involved with successful corporate transformations, and I mentioned these things to them, they the same thing applied in organizations as well. Hmm. Whether it was, yeah. and, and this crossed industries, whether it was pharmaceuticals or, uh, or technology or uh, credit ratings or whatever it was. Yeah, totally. So let's dive into that. Um, culture Lab is a podcast for people who want to harness the power of the culture, whether it's uh, the culture in their team or their organization as a whole. And people listen to the podcast looking for ways that will help them bring about transformational change. And, you know, one of the things that I learned over the years is uh, about transformational change is that when it comes to culture, you cannot mandate a culture change. Um, and, you know, what you can do is to start a culture change movement. And so when I saw your book, I thought, wow, I really need to speak to Greg because he has some really powerful stuff to share about what makes movements successful. So let me start with asking you this. Why did you become so obsessed with movements? Oh well, that is because I uh, I I found myself in 2004 in Kiev, running a major news organization during the Orange Revolution. So that had quite a quite a bit of impact. It was an incredible thing to be a part of. But during the Orange Revolution, what I noticed was is that in this incredible way. Uh, thousands upon thousands of people who'd ordinarily be doing thousands upon thousands of different things would stop what they were doing and start doing the same thing all together in unison in ways that were large and small. And I thought to myself, gee, I'd really like to be able to do that because here I'm running a pretty significant enterprise. And there's, I have these thousands upon thousands of different customers buying thousands upon thousands of different things. I want them to, you know, unite on the one thing that I want to sell them. And I have these hundreds of employees and they have hundreds of different ideas. I want them to embrace the initiative that I think is important. The same with advertisers mm -hmm. and investors. So that's what... You're not alone. A lot of our <laughs> listeners are in the same so that's situation, what set I guess. me out on my journey. And a few years later, I was in Silicon Valley and, uh, and everybody was talking about social networks. And we had a very, very large... Uh, digital business. And I said, gee, I should, I should really learn about this. So I started studying network theory. And what I found was a mathematical explanation for everything that happened during the, uh, during the Orange Revolution. For instance, as, as you know, in my book, uh, you know, I really found out about the Orange Revolution one morning when I woke up and my fiance was heading out the door. And I said, <laughs> Yeah, what a and, surprise, and, right? Because it, it, you said she wasn't really very no, politically she wasn't, active. And I, I said, "Where are you going?" She said, "I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to the demonstration." I, I said, "But I thought you weren't interested in politics." She said, "Yeah, you know, yeah. I wasn't, but it's enough already, and we have to do something." And it was like somebody—it's enough already. Somebody flipped a switch, and everybody we knew was going mm -hmm. out to demonstrations. I mean, it was something yeah. that nobody would talk about. Nobody, you know, in, in contrast to Poland, where, uh, you, as you know, the national sport is to come to work in the morning and, and, and read Gazette of Aborcia and then, Kurva, pizda, tupe, yabana. <laughs> Hopefully your <laughs> listeners don't speak Polish very well. Um, <laughs> Otherwise, we'll have to beep it out. <laughs> yeah, so, so and, and, and then I'm, I'm reading in network theory, and they're talking about a, an instantaneous phase transition. Exactly that. And on and on and on. So then that's what got me hooked. And so I started researching and writing. And then some, some years later, I, uh, I finally got to know Ja Popovich of Poor and Canvas, uh, who was... Uh, who's sort of instrumental, and he introduced me to all these frameworks that uh, that had been around for years. And it's actually a very funny story, one that I don't tell in the book. Um, around 2000, 
uh, right, you know, when they were in the final stages of overthrowing Milosevic, a guy named Bob Helvey, uh, who uh, who worked with Gene Sharp, who 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 sort of developed all these ideas about nonviolent struggle decades ago. He went to train the activists at Otpur. And while they were, while he was showing them all these uh, frameworks, like the, the pillars of support and spectrum of allies, they were just like, oh, we, we didn't know there was names for all this stuff. <laughs> they had, you know, they had figured it out. Because they, through their failures, they had failed in 92, failed in 96, um, much like in Poland, where they failed in 1970. And they, you know, and then they, they sort of failed again in 1980 and then succeeded in 89. So they, um, uh, but what I found so incredible in the book is every major movement, every historic movement, uh, except somewhat for the civil rights movement, could, because they they had they had really studied uh, Gandhi and 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 they were much more uh, prepared than the others. But pretty much all of them had some initial failures. They started off with much different, you know, personalities, philosophies, uh, contexts. But they all ended up with the same basic principles that allowed them to succeed, and that's what I thought was so incredible. And you talk about these principles in your book, and I'd like us to go through these principles together. Um, and perhaps to start, I want to ask you, what, what do you think is the biggest and the most uh, critical differentiator between a movement that brings about change eventually and one that only makes a lot of noise but doesn't really make a difference? Yeah, so well, I think the first thing is, is, is what your... Uh, you know, what your aim is. And, and I say a couple of times in the book, you have to want to really want to make a difference rather than just make a point. And you see so many of the ones that fail, like an Occupy, uh, you know, they, they're so intent on making their point and being right that they fail to, to make a difference. Um, so you can't try and overpower. You always have to attract. And I think in the corporate context, where you see efforts go wrong is that they're focused on convincing people. And, you know, we have this whole change management doctrine, which I always think is, is you know, it's, it's sort of like some consultants got together, you know, 20 <laughs> years ago or something and said, you know, we realize that people don't really <laughs> like to be told what to do. So, you know, let's come up with much nicer ways of telling yeah. people what to do. And there's so much... You know, um, there's so much talk and time spent on whether, to, you know, change should be top down or bottom up. But the truth is, is transformational change really happens side to side. And as soon as, as soon as you feel like you have to convince people, you're going down the wrong path. Either you've, you've got the wrong problem or the wrong people. And the, the way to really bring about transformational change is to identify people who are already enthusiastic about the vision. And then you empower them to bring others in who are maybe slightly less enthusiastic. And those, and that's how you gain momentum and bring in more people still. So, and, and that's really what a cascade is is uh, so you want to identify those early apostles and, and empower them to, 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 to carry your movement. So do you still remember how you came up with the title for the book and this term cascade? What was the origin of that? Oh, it went through a bunch of really stupid titles over the years. I've been working on this book for 15 years. And it, to, do, it does seem like a lot of work has gone into this. This would be another of my questions, actually. How long did it take you to yeah. do all this research and pull it together? It seems like a and lot it, of time has and, and energy has gone into it. And it went through several iterations. And this is actually the fourth time I tried to get it published. So, uh, and it's a gut-wrenching, you know, Oh my goodness! Uh, yeah. Process of getting a book published, and I went through it three times, failed before I. And the only reason I succeeded the fourth time was the success of my earlier earlier book. So, 
Um, uh, but the, I don't know. The, the name Cascades just kind of struck me one day because it's. I think it's 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 it, it, you know it's a very colloquial term. Everybody knows what a cas. Everybody gets a feeling of what a cascade is, and at the same time, it's technically accurate. That's what. Uh, that's what it's called. It's uh, a viral activity is called a network cascade mm-hmm. or a yeah. viral cascade. Yeah. 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 So, so um, you, you're saying that basically the, the, the most important thing is not just want to make the point to be right, but actually make a difference. Um, and I think that it can be challenging though. Um, and it's darn difficult sometimes for, for companies and for people within the companies to identify what do we really stand for, you know, and what sort of change do we want to see? What does tomorrow look like? Um, so I wonder if you have any advice for our listeners, how to really articulate that vision clearly and gain some consensus. And then of course, start building the momentum uh, where people engage with that vision and commit to that vision. Well, it really just takes work. So in our workshops, what we do is we say, you know, if you could, if you could change anything, right? If, if I gave you like a magic wand or made you, you know, king or queen for a day and you could change anything you wanted, what would that change look like? You know, don't think about what's possible, but if there was anything you could change, what would it be? And, and that's quite a difficult question. Um, and it takes quite a bit of work to get there. But once you do, uh, you know, you have to sort of back up and then uh, and identify what I call a keystone change because that grand vision. Um, and I talk about a lot of them in the book, uh, whether it was the turnaround at IBM in the 90s and also Alcoa. Um, you know, implementing lean manufacturing techniques at uh, at uh, Wyeth Pharmaceuticals, or um, more recently, the cloud transformation at uh, at uh, at uh, Experian. They all um, they all came to it in different ways. For instance, at Experian, the CTO or the CIO he went to talk to customers and to find out what they wanted. And what what they wanted was real time access to data, and he said, "Well, if I, in order to do that, we need to switch to a cloud uh, architecture. We can't do that with a traditional architecture." So he saw that that was a great possibility, but he also saw that it was a really really big problem because you know experience a company that's been around for decades. They rely on that architecture. There was issues about their business model, not to mention the security. Um, a, a year ago, one of their competitors, Equifax, had a massive data breach. So this was, it was quite, quite a tough sell. But he didn't try to sell it all at once. What he did is he, he got together some people who were already enthusiastic about it and train them with the expertise and they help bring in some others. But even more importantly, he didn't try, try and achieve it all at once. He identified a keystone change, which was to build internal APIs. Um, and which, uh, so it, it, those were much, much safer. And, uh, and uh, what a keystone change is, it's a clear and tangible goal. It involves multiple stakeholders and it paves the way for a future change. So that was a clear and tangible goal. He had to get a lot of the same people on board that he would for the full cloud transformation. And because as soon as they, they, uh, they developed these internal APIs and they could share information between departments and divisions within the organization and people could get things faster and serve their customers better, they immediately saw the value and that helped build the momentum for the larger transformation. 
Yeah, totally. And this is the first principle actually in your book, find the keystone change. That's the first, the most important thing to identify that. And then you say, you know, the first principle actually is that changes small groups loosely connected, united by a shared purpose. (laughs) But in part two, in the practical part of the book, that is the first Mm -hmm. principle. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, so let's talk about what you do going from the, so let's say that you identify what needs to change. Um, the next step um, that you lay out in the book is planning. And my question is, you know, how on earth do you plan a movement? Uh, it's probably quite a, quite a challenging thing to do. So what have you learned from your research and from working with uh, organizations in terms of that? Well, again, here, this is where we can lean on the experience of decades. There are two tools that you use to build uh, a plan. The first is called the spectrum of allies. And your listeners can Google it uh, and an image search and it will come up. There is, and you, you, you basically want to define who are going to be your most active supporters, who are going to be passive supporters, who are going to be neutral, who are going to be passive resistance, and who are going to be active resistance. And that sort of lays out the terrain. You can imagine uh, like a general looking at maps. The, The spectrum of allies is your map, right? So that's the first step in the plan. And you want to focus your efforts as far to the right of the spectrum of allies as you can. Uh, so not into active, uh, active resistance, but pretty deep into passive resistance and start moving passive resistors into neutral, neutral into, uh, passive support, passive support into active support. You know, that's so interesting because this is also one of the first stages that uh, we work on with our clients. We call it stakeholder mapping, but it's quite similar. And and very often, you know, people just completely skip the step and want to start planning actions without thinking about the whole ecosystem and who can support them and who could potentially um, be a person who's going to resist and basically create a lot of obstacles right? Well, stakeholders are a little bit different than the spectrum of allies. You make an excellent point. The, the, the spectrum of allies is all about constituencies. So these are people who, who, who very likely have no power, right? No power to change anything. Um, but you want to target your efforts as, as you know, as far into passive uh, resistors as you can but not quite into active resistors. What you want to do with active resistors, you don't want to engage with them, but you do undermine their support. And what what very often happens, and by very often I mean almost always, is once they feel that support being undermined, they will attack and overreach. And that sends more people your way. So the second, uh, so that's a spectrum of allies and that's constituencies. The second, is the pillars of support. And these are true stakeholders. So, you know, imagine, you know, some all-powerful dictator like Kim Jong-un or or Saddam Hussein or somebody like that. And then imagine what would happen if all the janitors decided not to come into work one day. You know, now that all-powerful dictator is absolutely powerless to to get the trash picked up. Right. So every regime, every status quo depends on certain institutions. And one of the mistakes I see with organizations is they they uh, classify stakeholders far too narrowly. So in a political movement, it's going to be something like, uh, you know, uh, pillars of support are going to be things like the military, the army, uh, uh, the police, the education system, the media, the business community. Um, uh, in a corporate transformation, generally uh, in a corporate transformation, people look at things like different departments. And those, are, of course, are important um, or uh, or you know, division heads or something like that. And of course, those are very, very important pillars. But often quite as, uh, just as important are things like uh, regulatory agencies, uh, industry groups, 
um, consumer groups, customer groups, sometimes the education system, partnerships with universities, uh, because there's all these, because they have an influence as well. And what you want to do when you're designing tactics, every tactic needs to mobilize a particular constituency in the spectrum of allies to influence a stakeholder in uh, in the pillars of support. So it's always you're mobilizing, you know, mobilizing what to influence what, right? And 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 then it, you can also track it dynamically with something called a power graph. But that's the basic idea of of, of how you start to build mm -hmm. a plan. So what's power graph? Because I think since you've mentioned that, uh, if you can just tell us briefly. So, so there you, you know, every three months or six months, you start mapping where uh, each institution in the, in the pillars of support is in terms of active support, passive support, neutral, uh, active, uh, pa passive resistance, active resistance. So that you're constantly looking at you know, who you're influencing and who. I mean, it's not very, very scientific. It's just where you feel they are on a scale of one to five. Um, but it does help to track and to say uh, and, 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 and help you sort of plan, where do we go next? Mm, yeah, I think measuring, even if it's just observable, and as you say, not very scientific, it really helps to move the needle. So uh, I can see why why that's important and baselining continuously where we are now um, as compared to where we started from and also in relation to where we want to go. So, um, okay, so that's very interesting. And that that, uh, that is a second principle, um, planning. Uh, with the spectrum of allies and pillars of support. Um, and let's talk a little bit about the first principle, the networks of small, loosely connected groups um, of people, uh, because that's definitely the fulcrum of your whole approach. It's, it's really important. Um, so can you talk to us a little bit about why they are so important and then how can someone leverage that in a company? Yeah, well, I think, you know, that's the, that's the first part of the book and that's the basic principle that runs through everything. And it's actually it's it's quite interesting because we've had this uh, we've had this notion of networks for centuries. I mean, uh, graph theory I think is two, over two hundred years old, and people throw this term around networks and ecosystems. Ah, it's a network. It's you know, uh, but what's in, what's really important is to know that there are networks are a mathematical phenomenon and. Net, there are certain principles and rules to network dynamics, you know, very much like, uh, you know, gravity means things, you know, if you throw something up, it's going to come back down. There are rules like that for networks that are very much laws of nature. Uh, and for most of the last 200 years, people thought, mathematicians and uh, experts and otherwise, the general thinking was that you had two properties to networks. One was uh, clustering, so really neat, tight groups. And we know in an organization having that strong cadre, that strong, uh, you know, team, tight teams is really, really important for excellence. We were talking about my wrestling earlier on. You know, it takes a while for teams to gel. Right. Um, and, and you really need that tight, tight team spirit to uh, and where people know each other very well to to perform at a very, very high level. You know, in, in the United States, we have like the Navy SEALs that are very much built on that principle. Uh, and then at the same time, you have path links. And this is how many degrees of separation or how much social distance there is in the network. And generally, the uh, the feeling had been that those two things were in opposition to each other. So you could have lots of, you know, very, very tight, tight clusters, or you could have, uh, 
you know, short social distance where everybody's connected to each other. And what was found by Watts and Strogatz in the, in the late 90s was not only could you uh, – not only could you have both, the best of both worlds, uh, in what they called a small world network, where you have tight clustering and short path links, so tight clustering and short social distances, but that networks a actually tended to become that way. And if you think about that from the, the, through the lens of an organization, because we know most organizations are not small world networks, if, uh, if networks tend to be small world networks and organizations tend not to be, then the only conclusion you can come to is that organizations are not small world networks because we prevent them from being so. And that's yes. really amazing, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. and, and the other thing is that it takes such a it takes a very very small amount of mixing to bring social distance within a network or an organization crashing down so uh you know some of the things that have been successful uh uh you know things like uh, uh just moving uh, just embedding people in different divisions for six months. That can be fair. But my favorite example, and I think really describes how, uh, uh, how you can organize, how you can uh, network an organization without disrupting it. Because you don't want to, you, you don't want to, uh, to, to, to do a big reorganization. You don't want to, you know, breaking down silos is something that people love to talk about. But you don't want to break down silos. Silos are good. Silos are centers of competence, right? You want to connect those silos. So there was one project done at a call center in a bank. And there was vast disparities between the performance of the different groups. So they, they did an analysis, and what they found was, was that the that 30 percent of the difference of the variation in performance could be attributed to the conversations that team members had outside of formal meetings so what they did uh what had been what 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 had been the practice before for breaks was that they would stagger breaks within each working group so that, you know, a few people would go out on coffee break or lunch break at a time. So, yeah, so, so that, that not, not everyone everybody. is on the break at so the same said, time. So they said, why yeah. don't we just stagger the groups and let them go out for breaks all together? And they did that, and there was like a 10%, 10 to 20% improvement in performance. And, and which represented fifteen million dollars, and and you don't even think of, uh, you don't even think of of a call center as as people who really need to collaborate. In more, uh, in more, um, you know, more highly technical fields, you know, where you really need collaboration, it's even more important. And there's great programs for that as well. For instance, Facebook does a, an engineering boot camp. So every engineer who goes to Facebook uh, needs to spend six months, uh, sorry, six weeks uh, training together with, uh, with each other and also working with, with uh, Facebook employees. And they all do it in the same place. Uh, and what they found later on was that uh, what they realized was People stayed connected. Those bonds people formed during their their boot camp, they stayed with uh, the, as people moved throughout the organization. And there's a network term for those types of people. Those are boundary spanner, spanners. So if you need something from some far flung part of the organization, you might not know how to get it. But the guy sitting next to you say, "Hey, you know what?" Uh, a guy I went through boot camp with, he, you know, he 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 works there, you know, and that that's the social distance just sort of shrinks. And we found in our company we did a, a similar type of training, and and got the same very similar results. 
Hmm. And that's my experience as well. So when we when we work with uh, companies around these issues, and that one of the issues that very often comes up is that there is quite strong interdepartmental collaboration, usually in most organizations that perform well, but uh, they don't have enough of cross-functional thing going on. And so a lot of organizations um, try to bridge that gap. And we've seen that really simple, let's call them interventions, like like Friday afternoon drinks uh, and stuff like that can have incredible impact. And as you say, it's just because you reduce that social distance and people can reach out easily for information if they need um, some, or even, you know, it's harder than to um, delay uh, the information that you pass on to the other department because it's not just an anonymous thing. It's a colleague that you know, and you had maybe a couple of beers together. So you feel more committed to helping them as well. Right. But I do think that, that it, you know, an important thing to remember is uh, those sort of random connections, uh, they're only random from the context of the organization to the people themselves, right? They're, those are strong connections. Those are good friends. You know, if your brother-in-law lives, you know, works in another division or in another, in, in another function, you know, that might, you know, from the perspective of the organization, that might seem like a random connection. It's not a random connection to you. That's your brother-in-law, right? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yes. So, um, since networks are so important for transformational change, I'm not surprised that one of the steps, one of the principles in your approach is then creating platforms for participation and you call it platforms for participation, mobilization and connection. I think we, we've started chatting about that, but I wonder if you have any other ideas for our listeners, what should they be doing to build the right architecture to support participation and connection? Well, uh, they, you know, these things have to be low cost, right? You can't force them. And you remember that story from, from, from Poland. This was during the sort of dark days of solidarity. And, and they, they didn't, uh, and, and they called a media boycott that people wouldn't watch the news at seven o'clock, I think it was. And, uh, so, so they boycott, but, but it's very difficult to, to really get that going because how do you build social proof? Right. I mean, how do you show people? How do you feel good? How do you connect with others who believe as you do when you're just at home, not watching TV? Right. Uh, so <laughs> what they did was everybody went out for a walk at seven o'clock and some mm -hmm. of them carried, you know, carried their TV in a wheelbarrow or a baby carriage or something. And it caught on. It wasn't something difficult. It was low cost. It was fun. Um, there weren't a whole lot of consequences. I mean, nobody's going to get, get arrested for going for a walk. And it caught on. And, and, and the, the, the regime, uh, they had to, eventually they had to raise, the, lower the curfew down to five o'clock or something like that. Um, but they, but by that point, they looked ridiculous. So those are the types of, of platforms that you want to, uh, those are the type of platforms that, that you want to engage people with. Things that build And connection. I understand that one, one, Oh, one of the really important elements from from what I've read in your books, that there was a common thread there, um, that the things that you do to connect people have to be, there's a certain amount of humor, a certain amount of fun. It has to be easy for people to do. Um, I think those are the themes that I have seen. And relatively low risk. Um, and I think definitely, you know, it's safer in the numbers. So if you see your neighbors um, taking their TVs out as well, of course, it's, it's safer in the numbers. But also at the end of the day, it's, it's not such a hugely risky thing to do. Um, but I think what it does is it makes people committed to the cause. And perhaps next time they would be willing to do something even more risky or something that requires even more effort on this. Right. Side. From a corporate point of view, um, what you want to do, because humor and everything like that, it's really, as you said, about lowering the cost. But from a corporate point of view, what you want to do is you want to do get the maximum impact, maximum connection 
for the least disruption, right? So you don't want to break down silos. You don't want to be breaking things down. Um, so, uh, you know, certain easy, easy things like, um, volunteerism. So a lot of corporate social responsibility is, you know, is, a, a, a it, you know, is, is becoming a bigger and bigger thing. So how can you reimagine those programs to help people connect and work together for a day or a week or whatever it is uh, that I love that example of the call center, you know, zero, dis I, I, you know, I can't, what do you think it costs to let people go out on break together rather than separately? I mean, probably nothing. And, and, and there was probably no resistance to it. One of the things that was so interesting when I was talking to the chief human resources officer at, uh, at Experian, he told me that, you know, we saw that we did this uh, bike ride and uh, that they do a bike ride every year. And we, we saw that, you know, these people who are doing the, the, the charity bike ride, that they're forming real bonds and those bonds are turning into professional uh, collaborations across organizational barriers. So he said, I, I wanted to think how else we could do that. So he started tapping people to, uh, to build clubs around things that they were already passionate about and to bring others in. And then they started something, uh, I forget what it's called, um, but groups around identity. So women's groups. Uh, so there's a, there's a women of Experian. There's a military veterans of Experian. There is a gay pride at Experian where people can connect about around things that they're passionate about. So that's that's really how you get people involved, not, not, not trying to rile them up and get them enthusiastic, but to give them a platform uh, and empower them for something that they already are passionate about. One final step um, and, and an important element of your approach is when you are successful with all these things and you sort of already accomplished your keystone change or you're close to making it happen then it's all about surviving victory right so <laughs> it implies that victory can be dangerous right why is that well because every revolution inspires a counter revolution right so um and this is one of the reasons why you want to work to build those networks first because even an early victory uh, the people who are against this type of change, uh, they will immediately fight back against it. So, so it's, it's very easy to get lackadaisical once you've, you feel like you've won your victory. Uh, and that's when those who, who oppose you will, uh, will strike. So, you know, a, a very clear example of this, of, of course, in in uh, in Egypt, where they you know got rid of Mubarak and ended up with uh, Al Sisi, uh, but also in in the corporate world and organizations, so often we see turnaround efforts or a startup get you know get some initial success and then immediately fall by the wayside, and which so the way you avoid that is you plan to survive victory from the beginning. And you do that by focusing on values, your values and your culture. One of my favorite examples of this is uh, Nelson Mandela in, uh, in, in South Africa, where, you know, for years people were accusing him of being, uh, you know, a, an anarchist, a communist, all sorts of things. And he said, you don't have to, you don't have to, to, uh, guess what I believe in. It was all written down back in 1955 in what was called the Freedom Charter. And then when he got into power, uh, he had to keep by those principles. So he couldn't oppress white people because in the Freedom Charter, it's an equal rights for all people. Uh, and it wasn't mm -hmm. about Nelson Mandela or the ANC. It was always about those values. So when he got into power by keeping those values, uh, because values are always constraints. That's why 
we think of Nelson Mandela today as a hero, not some tin pot dictator who once he, he got into power started oppressing others. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's a really great example. And you talk about values in an interesting way in the book, um, which I find... Just yeah, if I can absolutely. add, if, if I can add one more thing, um, what, was, what was amazing to me is how clear those same principles carried over to the, uh, to the corporate world. For instance, uh, one of Lou Gerstner's key lieutenants in the, uh, in the IBM turnaround in the 1990s, he told me, you know, if, if, that, if that revolution in, in the 90s, if it had just been about strategy or technology, IBM wouldn't be around today. He said, but because it was all, it was really about values, that allowed us to evolve and adapt as market conditions and technologies changed. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so let's make a quick recap of all the steps for our listeners um, in, in the practical part of the book, um, because I think we've, we've covered all of them, but it would be great to do a quick recap and give our listeners all the steps in one go. So the first, the first principle was find that uh, keystone change that you want to make, right? Right. And then do you want to walk us through it? Sure. Uh, so, so first is identifying a keystone change. Second is making a plan with the spectrum of allies and pillars of support. Uh, third is to network your movement. Uh, fourth is to indoctrinate a genome of values. And just a few words about that. I call it a genome of values because values are rules for adaptation. Mm -hmm. And uh, values are important because they are constraints. One of the things I do in, in workshops, I ask people what their values are. And they usually say things like commitment to customer, excellence. And then I say, what do those values cost you? Because they don't cost you anything. They're not really a value. So that's the fourth thing, uh, indoctrinating a genome of values. The fifth is building a platform, building platforms for participation, mobilization, and connection. We talked quite a bit about that. And then finally, to, uh, to uh, plan to survive victory. And if our listeners want to find out more about these principles, they can definitely get your book. And I would definitely recommend doing that. Cascades, how to create a movement that drives trans transformational change. I think it's going to hit the book source really soon. April 11th, is it? April 12th. 12th. Very close. Okay. You're very good. <laughs> so definitely get the book. Um, where else can people find out more about you, about the approach, about the work that you're doing? Well, you can find more about me on my website, gregsatel.com, uh, and also uh, on my blog, which is digitaltonto.com. Awesome. And it's a great blog. And it's been, um, I think, ranked as one of the top blogs on innovation and change, wasn't it? A number of times. Uh, innovation, excellence uh, 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 ranks, ranked yeah. me, I think, to number two on their list. Wow, congrats. Year. And congrats on the book. It's really great. It's, a it's great still resource. room for improvement, right? <laughs> Always. Number two. <laughs> Always. <laughs> so, Greg, I think we're ready to move to the last section of the interview, which is the rapid fire questions. And I'm going to ask okay. you five questions in rapid succession and we'll aim at answering them in under two minutes. Are you up for it? Okay. okay. I'm up for it. <laughs> Let's go for it. So how do you define organizational culture? A, a culture is how a, an organization uh, uh, honors its mission. And what are the signs that a company culture needs some work or perhaps even a major overhaul? A, that's a very good question. Um, I would say when behaviors undermine the mission. What company do you admire for their culture and why? Uh, Experian is a company I've, I've spent quite a bit of time with uh, over the past few years and researched in, in quite amazing detail, in quite good detail. And, and they always, always impress me for their culture. 
Um, and you know a culture because people seem relaxed and friendly mm. uh, when you meet them. Yeah. Yeah. And are there any books on culture or leadership or change or innovation that you would recommend to our listeners? Well, about innovation, mapping innovation. Definitely. My first book. <laughs> In terms of culture, I would say anything that Bob Sutton at Stanford mm -hmm. writes, whether it's the no asshole rule, uh, he is scaling up excellence is quite good, good boss, bad boss. And he's, he, he's going to have a new one coming out, I think, on, on friction. But uh, in terms of culture, I would say Bob Sutton from Stanford is the gold yeah. is really the gold standard. Bob Sutton is and absolutely he, amazing. Yeah. And he, yeah. he, he did um, write a blurb for your book as well, which is on the cover. I'm looking at it now. And it says, among the most useful, engaging and well-crafted books ever written on how to start and sustain large-scale change. Wow, that's quite a compliment coming from him. Bob is Bob is very generous. <laughs> he, he really is a so. wonderful it's, human it's being. It's not a matter of generosity, uh, but it's um, I can imagine it can be quite... Um, um, quite um, fulfilling to um, have Bob say that about your book. Um, okay, so how about um, one thing that our listeners can do tomorrow to sort of, you know, set up their own culture lab and start cultivating a culture that will help them and their teams to bring their vision to life? Identify your apostles. Okay. Who are going to be those first enthusiastic people who are going to spread your gospel. Mm -hmm. Okay. So one last thing, um, who would you recommend uh, I have as a guest on the podcast? Well, Bob Sutton would be <laughs> okay. a good one. Uh, he's, he's obviously a great one. Yeah. You, you might also want to invite uh, Serja Popovich. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, you know, who'd be a great one actually. Who? I'm just looking at my endorsements. Mm -hmm. um, Chris Fussell at the uh, at the McChrystal Group. Okay. Cool. Uh, team of Teams uh, yeah. is the more famous one, but but he wrote one mission. Mm -hmm. so that would mm -hmm. be a good one. Okay, fantastic. So I got three recommendations. That's great. Thank you. Um, Wow, that's been really, it's, it's been such a pleasure speaking to you, uh, Greg. Thank you so much for coming on Culture Lab. Uh, it's an incredibly useful approach and I've learned a lot from you. Uh, definitely going to use some of the principles in your book with um, working with organizations. Um, so thank you for writing the book. Thank you for spending so many years researching that uh, topic. It's, it's fascinating. Um, yeah, and I hope we can get you um, sometime in the future again. Dziękuję serdecznie. Bardzo proszę. Wielka przyjemność. <laughs> cała, cała przyjemność na moje strona. Wow. <laughs> przyjemność. That's so, a tough one. This is so impressive, everyone, that Greg speaks such fluent Polish. It's just unbelievable. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Dziękuję. <laughs> I'm Aga Bayer, the creator and host of the Culture Lab podcast, and this is the Culture Lab team. Production manager, Lindsay Nunez. Art director, Emily Spencer. Content editor, Rachel Nice. Sound producer, James Ead, Be Heard. If you haven't subscribed to Culture Lab yet, you can do it on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and many other places where podcasts are available. If you'd like to subscribe to my newsletter, The Culture Lab Insider, go to www.agabayer.com slash podcast and scroll down to the very bottom of the page. That's www.agabayer.com slash podcast. Also, we would be ever so grateful if you could rate and review Culture Lab on iTunes. And before we say goodbye, I want to give you a short preview of my next interview with Lindsay McGregor. 
Lindsay was recommended as a guest by one of our listeners, Lauren Robis. And Lauren, I want to say thank you so much for introducing me to Lindsay. She's amazing and she completely knocked my socks off. Lindsay is the co-author of New York Times bestselling book, Primed to Perform, How to Build the Highest Performing Cultures Through the Science of Total Motivation. And needless to say, because it's a brilliant book on motivation and on culture, I simply couldn't put it down. I completely divided it in a day. And I recommend that you get it too if you haven't read it already. Lindsay is also the CEO and co-founder of Vega Factor. It's a company that's based in New York and helps organizations build high-performing operating models. Um, as I said at the beginning of this episode, Lindsay and her company are an inspiration, and I'm sure that you'll understand why when you tune into the full interview in two weeks from now. But for now, here's a short preview of our conversation where Lindsay talks about the two types of performance, tactical performance and adaptive performance. Tune into the full episode to find out how you can ensure that your team excels at both. If your tactical performance is how well you've learned from the past, how well you've codified the past, how well you stick to the plan, the second half of performance is adaptive performance. And this is how well you diverge from the plan. When your plan doesn't have an answer, can you and your organization innovate, be creative, be inventive? Is your company stuck in time or is it constantly pushing the boundaries on how it does work? And what's really interesting about tactical and adaptive performance is that they're, they're opposites. If you emphasize one too much in your life or in your organization or your team, you start to destroy the other. Thank you for listening to this episode of Culture Lamp. If you found any moments that were interesting, inspiring, or maybe even game-changing, Please share it with someone who'd appreciate it. After all, good ideas are meant to be shared.